You're listening to the Exhibitionist Podcast, hosted by Nicola Reader and brought to you by InspiringExhibitors.com and Pro Extra, a wholly owned subsidiary of 12th Man Solutions Limited. Hi there and welcome to episode 30 of the Exhibitionist Podcast. I'm your host, Nicola Reader, and thank you once again so much for joining us on this very chilly December afternoon. So today we're going to be speaking to Matthew Funge, who is the founder and director of Your Stand Builder. But before we get to that conversation, I just wanted to draw your attention to a piece of research which has come out from UFI today, which I thought was really interesting. And they have released a marketing white paper about matchmaking and the role that matchmaking plays at the heart of the exhibitions industry. Now, this is a free-to-download report over on the UFI website, and it's well worth a read. But there are a couple of statistics in there that really surprised me. Now, matchmaking, we would always say to any of our clients, is fantastic and one of the must-do elements as part of an exhibition. So if any event that you're going to as a visitor or you're exhibiting at offers any kind of matchmaking service, then it's really worth participating in. But when we're doing that on behalf of our clients and project managing it and trying to get those match made meetings for them, we often really suffer from a lack of relevant participants and other people who were signing up to be on the platform. For example, we had a client who was out at a show with about 130,000 visitors a couple of months ago. Yet on the matchmaking app, there were probably about 300 people to match with. So it didn't feel like a really strong representation. Therefore, the first statistic that I saw from UFI, that 90% of participants to their survey were already participating in matchmaking, really surprised me. Now, it could be that they have asked event organisers, and it's 90% of event organisers that are offering matchmaking as part of their event. But actually, if it's 90% of people across the industry as a whole already participating in matchmaking... To me, I don't see the evidence of that in either matchmaking we've participated in ourselves or on behalf of our clients. So it's interesting. If it is that number, that's fantastic because it feels like this is one of the strongest reasons for the exhibition industry to exist. In fact, what they say themselves is that the exhibition industry is there. We exist to facilitate meetings between people. So brilliant if there are that many people participating. I was slightly cautious of that number. The number I think is absolutely definitely true is that 71% of people or from the respondents thought it was either important or very important as part of the event. So matchmaking crucial as part of an exhibition or event for 71% of people. And that's absolutely fantastic. If it's that important to that many people, then let's all make a real concerted effort to make it happen, whether you're a visitor, an exhibitor or an organiser questioning really whether you're playing as strong a role as you can be in making that matchmaking work. So the research in itself goes into a lot more detail than I'm going to, and I think the summer at the end of it was that actually from the survey they did 10, 15 years ago, the the matchmaking at exhibitions has moved on. It is really important, it has developed, but there's still masses of room for improvement. And some of the real concerns that respondents had around matchmaking, the biggest challenges, well, two really. One was around no-shows. So 45% of people were saying that the the biggest concern they have around matchmaking is people just not showing up, although that has come down from 70% since the last time they did the survey. So great strides forward in terms of that, but still no-shows causing people to query whether they would participate or not because they think people aren't going to turn up. And the second biggest challenge that people recorded in terms of this whole idea of matchmaking is that there's just no relevance with the person they're being matched with. And that's really interesting because there seem to be two ways in which organisations are matching visitors and exhibitors up at the moment. Some of it is done purely by you as a visitor looking online, seeing who's there, who might be relevant for you, who you want to meet, and you extending the invitation or vice versa, a visitor Uh, extending the the invitation to you the other way is for it to be done via an algorithm and either that that might be completely automatically via the organizer so it's just done completely in a systemized way or it could be that algorithms suggest to the event organizer who they might match up the organizer then adds some of their own intelligence and knowledge around exhibitors to that and makes that that suggestion to an exhibitor but actually a lot of people are saying 
they, that information and the registration process where people are entering their details about what their business is and who they want to meet, actually when we meet them, it's just not true. There's a bit of catfishing going on. And actually when we sit down and talk, we don't have anything in common. They've maybe just exaggerated some of their products or services because they want to meet us. So as with any online matching dating agency or putting businesses together, um, perhaps sometimes we're not always as honest as we could be. But actually what would be brilliant is if you think of Netflix or Amazon or Google or any of those online shopping services where they give you a recommendation based on your previous viewing, wouldn't it be brilliant if matchmaking exhibitions could look at what you're interested in, look at who you've already invited to meet and then say, actually, based on that, these people could be really interesting to you. So what's the report saying that we could do better in the future? Well, definitely better data, which is down to all of us. And again, that's really hard because you don't want a registration form that takes 20 minutes to fill out because people will just get bored and switch off. But actually, you need much more data than we currently have to be able to make relevant connections and relevant recommendations to put people together. Actually, is the more management time that needs to go into it from event organisers themselves. So thinking about not just leaving it to those algorithms, but really getting to know exhibitors, really getting to understand what their objectives are and who they want to meet, and then trying to pump that information out more through their marketing systems to visitors, to, for visitors to be able to make educated decisions about who they want to meet. What about incentives or fees to turn up? Most people are still saying, we're not paying for matchmaking and we don't think we should. But what if we could make it even more valuable? Well, that could be another revenue stream or not necessarily a fee, maybe some kind of incentive or something that, that works for everybody that just makes sure people turn up to the right meetings with the right people. And technology there should absolutely be an enabler to help us with matchmaking. If we remember it, the, the basis of this, it's all about creating that face-to-face -face meeting. So technology shouldn't replace matchmaking or shouldn't be the only driver. It should be enabling better informed decisions about who we're going to match make with. Um, there is stacks more in the research and some brilliant case studies about where matchmaking's worked really, really well. And we would always say, definitely, if it's offered as part of your exhibition, whether you're an exhibitor or a visitor, always use that platform to try and just generate some of the meetings with the right people. Don't leave it to chance that they're going to walk by your stand. But actually a plea for the new year that all of us try and get a little bit more involved and be a little bit more proactive with matchmaking to make it more relevant, to make it more useful and valuable for all of us that are working in the industry. So I would thoroughly recommend if you have a spare 10 minutes hopping over to the UFI website and um, downloading that free marketing white paper which is called Matchmaking at the Heart of the Exhibitions Industry. Well worth a read. Hopefully that's useful and it leads us on brilliantly actually to today's conversation which as I mentioned is with Matthew from Your Stand Builder and he's all about a bit of matchmaking and his business is built on uh, exhibitors being able to put in tenders and put information that stand builders and stand agencies can then review and pitch for. So kind of matchmaking between exhibitors and agencies but he will explain it better than I can so over to our conversation. So on this week's episode of the Exhibitionist podcast, we are excited to have Matthew Funge, who is the director and founder of Your Stand Builder. So welcome to the show, Matthew. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thank you. This is Matthew's first time on a podcast, so we are delighted to have him with us. And I know we're going to pick his brains over the next 20 minutes or so. But before we get into all things stand design, Matthew, just give us a little bit of background about your experience in the industry. Yes, so um, I, I used to work at a, a company, a global healthcare company, who uh, were very heavily involved in global exhibitions, and I was in an event planning, event management type role there, so I, I took responsibility for planning all of their exhibitions and trade shows all around the world. Um, I was in that role for about five years, and then through my kind of day-to-day -day frustrations, I... Um, realized that uh, it was quite difficult at times to find stand builders uh, for events in, in places that you'd never been to before um, as a company. So that's kind of where the idea came from. But I've got uh, five years or so uh, direct experience with exhibitions, trade shows, dealing with stand builders, um, and obviously first-hand experience from the exhibitor side of things as well. 
Brilliant, thank you. And you have my deepest sympathy. I was working for my company in events and when everything goes brilliantly, it's all great and everyone loves you. But when things go wrong, then it's always your fault. So I know exactly how that feels. Absolutely. And, and given the nature of exhibitions as well, and particularly the stand design, stand builders, things often don't go wrong until the very last minute. And uh, <laughs> you're very much up against it to, uh, to fix things in time for the, uh, the show opening. Yeah, thinking creatively and coming up with ways to patch things up is always a key skill in exhibitions. So you've given us a bit of background there about your experience, but what really inspired you to start your stand builder? So, yeah, when I was um, kind of growing up, even back to my school days, I, I always had the um, the kind of drive to start my own company at some point. Um, obviously, back then, I, I wasn't so sure in which direction that would be. But then through my day to day experiences um, where I was previously and, and the frustrations that I identified in, in doing my day job, I took um kind of uh, took inspiration from similar companies in different industries who have identified that real problem area and, and that real kind of sore spot for uh, people who are doing it all over the world. Companies like Airbnb, they, they brought the uh, kind of home rental, short-term rental market all together. Um, and TripAdvisor, obviously, you know, anywhere hospitality-based now has a review and their own page and everything like that. So it was kind of an idea to bring the exhibition uh, exhibitor stand builder relationship into one simple place rather than just basically having a free-for-all on Google or a search engine uh, where you don't really know where to start when you're searching for a stand builder. Absolutely. So for those listeners of ours who aren't as familiar with your stand builder, tell us exactly what the platform does. Sure. So it's uh, in its most basic sense, it's an online marketplace uh, platform which brings together two sides of the exhibitions industry and exhibitors, so companies who are exhibiting at an event and stand builders, stand contractors who obviously provide and supply the stands. So it's uh, it's an online platform whereby an exhibitor can go online, they can upload their project details of an upcoming event that they're exhibiting at, um, they can upload a design, they can put all the key information about that project and that immediately then gets sent to our network, our global network of stand builders who are invited to view all the details and prepare their quotes and then submit it for the exhibit to, to consider. Um, so it's bringing it all together in one place rather than relying on email, going back and forth to multiple suppliers at once and waiting, you know, an, an endless amount of time for replies um, sometimes. So uh, that, that's kind of the idea behind it, what, we, uh, what we're doing. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, sorry to get into the murky world of money, but how does it work? Is it an exhibitor who pays to post their project or is there a commission paid to the winning design agency? So it's completely free from the exhibitor side of things. Um, so we're providing a service whereby we just make their lives simpler and easier, hopefully. Um, so on the stand builder side of things, we do charge a monthly subscription um, because we're acting as a as form of lead generation for them. So it's business development. Um, however, we do offer a six month free trial at the moment for all stand builders with this being a new concept in the market. Um, and then on every completed project that uh, is successful through the platform, we will charge a, a small commission uh, based on the percentage of the value of the project. So as both an exhibitor yourself and your experience from the clients you deal with now, what are some of the biggest challenges that exhibitors are telling you about in regards to stand design? So around stand design, I think um, given the international nature of the exhibitions industry, I think um, a lot of the time you've got people, exhibitors on one side, stand builders on the other side who don't share a common language, first of all. Um, and very often they're communicating in their second or even third language. So to really articulate those design ideas successfully can become a little bit of a challenge um, and almost kind of lost in translation kind of situation. Um, so the way that we've kind of addressed that on uh, the YSB platform is on the project page, there is a, an open Q&A board where in advance of awarding the contract, the you know, exhibitor can post their project, the stand builder can ask the questions that they want to, they can spend time thinking about what to type rather than 
um, having to discuss it over a phone call, which is quite difficult if it's not your first language. And um, yeah, really tried to simplify that and to to make it absolutely clear from start to finish so that everyone's on the same page when they submit a quote on the stand builder side of things um, and everybody knows what's being agreed between the two parties. Um, so there is that in terms of, um, yeah, uh, when it comes to stand design, I think the age old thing is, is how do you attract people onto the stand? How do you get those people, those visitors who are walking down the aisles onto your stand and not the one next to you, not the one five stands down or not the super duper double decker one in the middle of the, the exhibition hall. And it's, it's those kind of innovative thinking outside the box design ideas that i think a lot of exhibitors who maybe aren't as experienced in exhibiting at events they they perhaps don't think of that or struggle with uh, the creativity side of things when it comes to that because there's so many different things you can do but a lot of them have been done many times over already and in all likelihood there's going to be somebody else in that exhibition hall doing those common uh, kind of things um, so you've got to be a bit creative and I think that's probably one of the most difficult things to, to think about when you're designing a stand. Okay and just building on that thinking about that stand design brief I know in my early days my stand design briefs were I want it to look amazing and I want it to get loads of people there which doesn't really help the stand design agency come up with anything tangible so what is it that you'd want to see an exhibitor put into their stand de- design brief that really helps that agency think, yep, I know what this company is all about and I know what they're trying to achieve at this exhibition. So I think that, um, yeah, we stand designers who are using the YSB platform will need to know that. They will need to be able to tailor their design accordingly, depending on what the company is trying to achieve at that event. Um, another thing as well, which I think doesn't come to mind immediately, but stand builders need to know where a stand is located on a floor plan as well. They need to know the direction at which visitors are coming from. They, they need to know just the positioning of it, what stand is next to them, what stand is behind them, things like that. And from my experience, um, mainly in, in the kind of uh, nine or ten months we've been doing YSB now, it's something which perhaps isn't always at the front of uh, exhibitors' minds to include in their brief, but it is actually a very important uh, thing to share with the stand builder. Absolutely. And regular listeners to the show will not be surprised when I echo your thoughts there about nailing those smart objectives right at the very start of the process and being really clear and really sure what your proposition is all about and how you're going to appeal to exhibitors and visitors to give that design agency a good chance of actually nailing something that's right for you. So thinking on the other side of the coin for stand design agencies, What are some of the pitfalls that you sometimes see those agencies fall into where they've maybe misinterpreted a brief and and get it wrong? Yeah. So I I think sometimes, uh, going back to my previous point, I don't think they uh, completely understand at all times all of the intricacies of the request at times. Um, If you've got a very particular exhibitor who wants things a very particular way, then um, maybe at times a stand builder or an agency might not appreciate just how specific that request is. For example, um, when I used to be in my previous role, we worked once with a stand builder and and we provided Pantone color codes for them. And they kind of looked at it and thought, well, we're going to have to mix all of this. We're going to have to do all this. We're going to have to get it exactly right. Why don't you just use this? It's very similar. It's a similar color paint. It's not even going to be noticed. Whereas, no, the whole brand was built upon this particular Pantone color and it had to be that one. And there was no movement on that whatsoever. But they, the stand builder that we were working with at the time didn't quite get that. And they, I think in truth, they wanted to make their life a bit easier. But um, it's that kind of thing. And, and some... Another similar one is uh, something as simple as a font used on text on the exhibition stand. Even if it's very similar, even if it's not noticeable to the eye, you can guarantee that the marketing manager, the person in charge, creative director at the exhibitor company will notice it. They won't like it and they will want it the way that it it should be. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree. I think it's that really early attention to detail of the things that are non-negotiable in that stand brief. So whether it's a logo, whether it's a strap line, whether it's corporate colours, whether it's about the wording of a proposition, whatever it is that really is fundamental to the brand, if you have a brand that needs to be kind of that rigid around those guidelines, then just clarifying those early on and making sure that 
everybody's aware of them will really help later on in the process. Yeah, and a lot of the, the brands that you see at, at the larger trade shows, they've built up this brand that's instantly recognisable. And if they deviate from that even slightly, it's going to be noticed by their customers, their clients, their partners. It's, it's, they've built up such a strong brand that any kind of difference is, is going to be very obvious, I think, which is why they're so keen to get it exactly as, as it should be. So you've been in business now um, almost a year, so quite a youngster in terms of your own business, although obviously all that experience from being in the exhibitions industry. So tell me about some of the successes you've had so far of matching together exhibitors and stand design agencies. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in fact, one of our, one of our, it was either our first project or our second project way back at the start in, in March last year. Um, I say way back, it was not that long ago, but uh, it seems a long time ago. Um, we we had a, a company who came to us and they were looking for a stand builder in Brazil, actually, for a show that they were going to out there. A show that they'd done for uh, a number of years, but they wanted to use our, ser- our service to see whether they were getting a fair market price, basically. And they put in their stand design, which was almost exactly the same as the, the year before, and within the space of, I think it was six days, they had received uh, a quote which was 37% less than they had paid last year for the exact same stand. And the reason for that is because it was a local stand builder that they hadn't come across the year before, who happened to be on the YSB platform, saw the project, quoted their best price. And it, I think it was a saving of over two and a half thousand pounds to this company, which can then go into the marketing budget for the rest of the show in terms of giveaways or other things that they're doing um, rather than being tied up in the stand. And in terms of the quality of the stand and the size of the stand and and everything like that, it was more or less like for like compared to the previous year. So uh, that was a really nice one to get started with. Um, We've had a, a couple of other ones as well, which have been real success stories in terms of urgency. So we had an event organizer come to us in a bit of a panic two weeks before their event was supposed to take place. And they basically had told their exhibitors that they would um, put them in contact with stand contractors and they didn't have to worry about it. And they'd left it too late. So they were in a big panic. They had 35 exhibitors all wanting stands at two weeks notice. And I got a phone call one lunchtime from uh, this the person at this company, this um, organizer, I should say, and they're in a panic and they said, can you help us? We, we need somebody to help coordinate this. We need a company to basically take this off our hands, manage it and make it a success for all these exhibitors. And um, in the space of those two weeks, we, we managed to successfully match um, all the exhibitors who needed to stand with a stand builder who could supply it on time and for a reasonable price. Um, they, they weren't paying kind of last minute premiums as, as can be the case at times in the industry. Um, and the, the feedback we got from the organizer was just so positive in that we had uh, basically saved their skin, <laughs> um, which, uh, which was good. And the, the event went, went well, um, all the feedback was good. So uh, they had a very positive experience and they were very thankful for, uh, for a platform like YSB. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it goes back to a conversation we were having at the top of the programme around things going wrong, which they always will in exhibitions. That's the nature of the industry that we work in. And if you're not the type of person who enjoys reacting under pressure to things that are going wrong, then maybe it's not the the industry for you to work in. But it sounds like your platform provides a really great solution for those last minute requests or even those strange requests where somebody's got a lot of time but doesn't know where to go you've got the connections that can help fulfill those kind of weird or last minute requests that come in absolutely and that's kind of what we're hoping to be the go-to not only for the simple you know easy processes where people know what they want and it's it's easy enough to find somebody we want to offer that solution for any exhibitor um And we understand at the same time that there are going to be companies who have long-standing relationships with an agency, with a stand builder. And that's absolutely fine. We're not trying to prize them away from that relationship because it's obviously very important. What we're aiming for and what uh, what we think we're really good for is that kind of either an SME type company who uh, only does a handful of events per year. They have an in-house person who's uh, dealing with it all, planning it all and needs a bit of uh, assistance or even larger companies, but those who are not too experienced in exhibiting at trade shows who really don't know where to start when it comes to 
finding a stand builder. Um, so we're offering the service, obviously, to everybody, but I think it's going to be of most benefit to those two groups of, of exhibitors. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you must see lots of requests coming through for stand design. So tell me, what are some of the big trends that people are asking for at the moment? So I, I think it's a it's a somewhat predictable one, given that we're in, in 2019 now. But obviously, year on year, technology is becoming so much more important on exhibition stands. And the, there are various ways that it's, it's being incorporated. And every year, the technology is actually developing in itself as well. So um, things like... Um, big AV audiovisual video walls that we're seeing on stands now where an exhibitor isn't tied to the same design for three or four days of an exhibition. They can flick a switch and the next day it's a completely different looking stand almost. Um, so that's that's something that I'm seeing a lot of on the projects that are, are posted on the platform. Um, also, I think any kind of interactive technology as well, going back to my earlier point about attracting people onto the stand. I think there are various ways that technology can help with that as well in terms of there's a, there's a lot of companies who are using tablet-based games or interactive features now on the stand, which um, you know maybe weren't used so much in years gone by, but as that technology is developed and, and um, become more prominent, then people are more... Uh, open to using it I think on an exhibition stand and if people are walking past as a visitor at an exhibition um, then if they see something with a bit of a crowd and people causing a bit of a fuss with you know on a stand over to their left or they see something on a on a stand over to the right which you know no one's really taking much of an interest in they're going to be drawn towards it and whether they are potential customers to that company or not, it's still visitors on the stand. It's still, you know, people coming onto the stand. It's still opportunity to speak to people who may well turn out to be clients for, for that exhibitor. Um, so technology is very much uh, uh, um, the thing that I'm thinking is, is a big trend at the moment. And looking forward to the next 12 months, I think uh, a specific part of that, which is going to become very popular, is um, AR, VR. Um, so I, I saw something uh, recent, I think, when I was on LinkedIn. I think it was a car manufacturer who had a, a virtual reality um, headset uh, system on their stand. And basically, they were inviting people to come on and to basically configure their own version of the car, put on the headset, and they could see that what they had just built, basically. And uh, I thought that was a really clever idea that, that could be used in a number of industries and a number of companies who are exhibiting at events. And uh, again, it's that exciting technological kind of uh, attraction to the stand, which I think will be really successful. Yeah, I, I think there's so much tech that's available today, and it's great to see that coming through. But I think we as consumers are just so much more comfortable using tech. I think kind of going back 10 or 15 years, if you saw a touch screen or an iPad or something on a stand, you'd be thinking, oh my God, I'm going to be that, that visitor that breaks this stand or breaks the technology. So I'm just not going to get involved. I'm going to leave it alone. But now because we're all using smartphones and tablets and tech much more in our day-to-day -day life, we feel much more comfortable about actually engaging with it. It just feels much more natural than it ever did before. But I think as well, the point that we've covered in the last few weeks on our podcasts and blogs around Event Tech Live is this relevance of tech and making sure it's meaningful in the context of the proposition that you're trying to portray to visitors. Otherwise, it just becomes meaningless tech for tech's sake, really. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And there is a danger as well, I think, um, that you can try and put too much tech on your stand and it just gets a bit confusing. It just becomes too much and it, it's a little bit intimidating almost for visitors. So there's a balance to be found in that. Um, but I definitely think that the, there is a, a good level of technology to incorporate into the stand now in this day and age that will be of real benefit to, uh, to what you're offering visitors as, as an exhibition. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So as 2019 draws to a close, and I can't quite believe we're saying that already. <laughs> so what's been the best stand that you've seen in 2019 or the best stand that you've worked on and why? So there was one um, that I actually saw myself at a, an event in London. It was um, it was a coffee company, a very well-known coffee company. And um it was one of those where when you walk past, you know, without even seeing the branding, 
practice, you, you know, they almost kitted out a coffee shop that was very much in their style of their products um, that instantly you were walking past, you knew who it was, you knew what they did, you knew, you know, who you were going to speak to on the stand. It was very clear who the staff were, who the visitors were, because that can be a little bit unclear at times as well. It's a bit confusing. Um, and it was almost as if you were stepping into the life that they want you to be living because obviously it's, it's very much in line with the products that they're selling. Um, but I just thought from a branding point of view and from a um, hitting your target audience point of view, it was absolutely perfect. And um, I, I spent some time on that stand. I had a good look around. I'm, I'm quite nosy now that I'm doing what I'm doing with YSB. Um, but no, I had a good look around. Um, I obviously sampled the coffee as well, which was fantastic. And uh, I just kind of thought, whoever's sorted this out at the company, whoever's planned this, whoever's designed this, has got it exactly right. This is why companies go to exhibitions. This is what everybody who's exhibiting at the event wanted to achieve. And on the flip side, there's sometimes where you're walking around an exhibition, you'll see a you know fantastic stand that's obviously cost quite a bit of money, but you don't know exactly what they do and you don't know you know what they're trying to achieve it, it's big it's flashy it's fancy and it looks great but it doesn't really tell you anything as a visitor um and i think that's this this one that i uh, referred to a moment ago got it absolutely spot on in terms of that and that was one of my most memorable stands of the year um certainly um and then in, in terms of kind of um the wow factor um i was at um not this year actually but um last year medica um and in in germany big medical event and um, some of the medical uh, electronic companies that uh, you know have huge budgets some of the stands that they build are just phenomenal in terms of huge double decker stands with cafes meeting rooms presentation areas it's almost as if they've built a a mini office for four days within the exhibition that has everything they could possibly need and um just when you walk past it, you just think it's incredible how they've managed to create this within another building. And um, yeah, just incredible. So they, they always have the wow factor, but the, the earlier one that I mentioned is, is definitely one that's uh, memorable to me. Yeah, so I think that first example that you gave there is great that they had that real brand recognition and that consistency and also that relevance, that understanding of the target audience, who they're trying to market and what they're trying to say. I know when we walk around exhibitions and we're looking at stands, we always apply the so what factor. So we're looking at a stand thinking, yeah, if I had a problem, do I really understand just by looking at your stand, how you're going to solve it and why you're the best people to do it? We can look at some and just think, yeah, you look absolutely great, but I don't know what it is that you do. I don't know what problem you solve. I don't know what it is you're all about. So it's great when you do see that real relevance and clarity coming through in a stand design. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it is a difficult thing to do. I remember from where, when I was working in my previous role, um, I know the creative team always tried as hard as they could to keep everything so consistent. And it's a real challenge to get that absolute consistency and instantly recognisable to visitors. But um, yeah, th this stand that I referred to was uh, absolutely perfect. And, and they did an amazing job in doing that. And uh, I've actually since become a customer of theirs. So it obviously worked. <laughs> And um, without putting you on the spot now, you don't have to name names, but can you tell us any horror stories that you have seen during the course of the year? Um, ooh, so um, <clears throat> that, is, that is putting me on the spot a little bit in terms of uh, absolute horror stories. There are none that I particularly remember. There have been a couple I've been walking around and it's been day three, day four of the exhibition and under the warm lights for four days some of the graphics have been peeling off a little bit which is never good um I, i've not seen any absolute shockers because th that kind of thing i think again given what i do now and with ysb i think i'm going around exhibitions with more of a, an eye for these things and looking at the stands more carefully than i used to so i i probably noticed that whereas visitors typically wouldn't because it was only really in the corners it was starting to come off and it was day four so i think they got away with it but um <laughs> no 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 absolute shockers where I've, I've stood there and thought this is a disaster um i have seen it in the past of course i think uh you know everyone's had an experience of that where you've just kind of almost wanted to look away but um no the, i'd say that 2019 has been a, a mostly positive uh, mostly positive year in terms of my experience at exhibitions 
Yeah, and I think we would echo that and say in the numerous exhibitions we've been at this year, we've seen some brilliant stand designs. And there are far fewer these days of those three by three spaces where there's just like an A4 piece of paper with loads of content on, blue tacked onto a back wall somewhere. We're seeing much, much less of those out in the industry and people spending a little bit more time and effort in um, bringing their stands to life, which is fantastic. So if you could work on your dream execution, any stand for any company anywhere in the world, who would that be? Ooh, I, I, I think I've got one from a personal point of view and one from a professional point of view, if I may. So from a, from a personal point of view, and this is very uh, kind of based on me uh, personally, it would be Manchester City Football Club because they're my absolute, you know, absolute go-to interest in my life, Manchester City Football Club. Um, and given the way things have been at, at that football club in the last 10 years or so, I think they'd have a, an unbelievable budget for the stand as well. So it'd be almost anything goes, which is great. Um, but now for a more sensible response to the question from a professional point of view, um, I would absolutely love to uh, to work on a stand for a company like Disney, for instance, huge company, so many possibilities, obviously so much uh, by way of content that you can use from their various movies, books, whatever. Um, and you could go in so many different directions with it. And again, a company like that would have a, a tremendous budget for it. So it would just be almost like a complete free reign to do whatever you want to do. Um, and yeah, it would, I think it would just be a great experience. So, yeah, I think there would be some brilliant storytelling from Disney there. So, uh, Matthew, what you can't see is uh, Steve on the other side of the laptop at this end, who is sitting there in his Rotherham jacket because he is a Rotherham United fan. And uh, thinking back to a very cold January, I believe we played you in the cup earlier on this year. <laughs> yeah, and I think the final score on that day was not in Rotherham's favour. I think it was about 7-1. But we had a lovely day out and a lovely meal. So, you know, we can't complain. Really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was entertaining, if nothing else, I'm sure. <laughs> and the most frustrating thing being, actually, that we um, thought there was a chance of Rotherham losing. So we put a bet on in that way. And I think... Uh, we the, the final score was 7-0 but had it been 7-1 then we'd have come away with a few hundred pounds but we didn't Ooh. Ooh. yeah we just missed out on that one yeah that, that could have been a nice little uh, sweetener for an otherwise quite sour day I think <laughs> yeah. yeah and then when you have to drive all the way back up to Darlington from Manchester having lost by that many it's a pretty quiet journey home <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time today, Matthew. It has been great speaking to you, hearing about uh, your stand builder and all things stand design. So if people want to find you, where can they get in touch with you? So our web address is www.yourstandbuilder.com. Uh, we have all the social media channels as well. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, or if you just want to get in touch, then the uh, email is info at yourstandbuilder.com. Brilliant. Thank you for that. And if anybody's missed those details, give us a shout and we can share them alongside the episode. So again, thank you for your time. Have a brilliant 2020 and we look forward to seeing more great work courtesy of your stand builder. No problem at all. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Thank you. So thank you so much there to Matthew for that conversation. Hopefully, hopefully you found it useful, a different approach to finding a new stand builder. And uh, if you do use Matthew and his services at all, do let us know and um, keep us up to date on how that went for you. So that's pretty much it from us for this week. Obviously, we are now in that pre-Christmas season craziness, and it is, of course, Cyber Monday week. So we have been advertising our Black Friday and Cyber Monday offer online, and we're going to extend that until the end of the week. So if you want to cop grab a copy of the Exhibitionist book for just thirteen ninety nine plus postage and packing, that's a 25% discount this week. You can do it via the website at www.inspiringexhibitors.com. So that's www.inspiringexhibitors.com for 25% off the book, the journal and the bundle package until the end of this week. So hop over there and make sure you get your order in before the prices go back up. 
In a couple of weeks, the next podcast will be a review of the best bits of 2019, so an end of the year show. We've had some brilliant conversations and some fantastic advice from our guests this year. So we're going to put all that together into one place and uh, give you the best of 2019. If you want to get in touch with us, you can do that via all the usual methods. So hop, hop over to the website for our contact details, follow us on Twitter, or you can find us at LinkedIn. Hope you have a good couple of weeks as you get ready for the craziness of Christmas. If there's anything we can help with, please do get in touch as always. And happy exhibitioning. Hop over now to inspiringexhibitors.com to subscribe to our newsletters, blogs and future podcasts, keeping you up to date with industry insight. While there, you can also find out more about our new book, The Exhibitionist, Inspiring Trade Show Excellence. Once again, thank you for listening.